this week's drive, we get on track with Kimmy, survive a spectacular shunt in Alabama, do some hunting in South Africa, and rally to the cause in Corsica. All this and more on this week's Drive. We start with a different take on the world of Formula One, an art exhibition featuring work by some of the BAR team, amongst others. Drivers Jacques Villeneuve and Olivia Panis featured in some of the art and Jacques was asked about his car's development. So uh, I will just wait from Canada to see what actually really happens. And, uh, but I'm very confident in the people working on the project now. Uh, so I really hope that uh, the promises will come true. I need to say I feel good um, because we work very hard in the team, really. And uh, we need to finish with a both car. And maybe when we have opportunity to max on points, because uh, I know definitely for Canada we have a big improvement about the chassis side and the own, uh, engine side. This is a good point for us. Villeneuve, the 1997 champion with Williams, has recently hinted that he may not stay with the struggling team beyond this season. BAR have yet to score a point this year, and Villeneuve has only two third-place finishes to show for the four seasons with the team. Another team not currently enjoying much success is the McLaren-Mercedes pairing. For the 26-year-old Finn, Kimi Raikkonen, in his first full season with McLaren, the best result has been a third place in Australia. It's just disappointing, but actually you, you cannot really start thinking too much your last race. You just need to look forward for the next one. Now. McLaren hope their tyre suppliers Michelin might give them the edge depending on the conditions. Oh, it's it's going to be an interesting weekend because the weather, you don't know what kind of weather is going to be. Is it damp or wet? Asked about the early part of the season, Kimi is hoping for a change in fortune soon. Australia was good for me. I got my first podium and uh, got a little taste in there, but uh, then next two races uh, has been not so good because I haven't finished at those. But, uh, just need to look forward for, the, for this weekend and uh, do our best. Between races, the team keep up a relentless development and testing routine. The city of Manama, capital of the Kingdom of Bahrain, was the setting for the 2002 Bahrain 24-hour Supercart Challenge. Organisers were relieved as heavy overnight rain, which had soaked the circuit, drained quickly thanks to the use of a revolutionary aqua vacuum system. The leading competitors made their way onto the grid at the start line before the flag was lifted to signify the start of the 23-team endurance race. The flag waved on time to set off the teams on their 24-hour epic race. The early leader was Christophe Hizet of the Gulf Formula One team, number 19, who had earlier taken pole position. This was no surprise as he was the reigning Middle East Pro Kart champion. But disaster was soon to strike. The locally based Unstoppables in number one were leading the chase in second place, but they took the lead as the Gulf Formula One outfit were forced to make a pit stop after being penalised with a series of black flags for reckless driving, eventually losing over seven minutes to the leaders. The race officials explained to the disappointed Gulf Formula One team why they had been penalised, while the Penelope Pit Stops, the only all-girl racing team, made a rapid changeover of drivers in the pit lane as they chased the leaders. As day became night, the Unstoppables team maintained their lead through careful concentration. Leading the chase in the floodlit arena were Penelope Pit Stops, Unstoppables, Rev Zone Racing and the Gulf Formula One. Gulf Formula One pit crew held out a board telling them that they were in second place as daylight broke. 
The chasing pack were keeping up the pressure as the Penelope pit stops team cornered at speed. They would finish in fourth position to claim their highest ever finish in the championship. It was the last throw of the dice for the Gulf Formula One team as they made a frantic last changeover in a bid to reclaim the lead in the closing stages. However, that early penalty for reckless driving cost them dear as the Unstoppables team waved at the crowd as they cruised round on the final lap. Their pit crew waved flags in celebration as an official waved the chequered flag. The Unstoppables completed 1144 laps with the Gulf Formula One team seven laps behind. Sean Murphy, the winning driver and captain, was delighted as the team's preparation and race plan had been duly rewarded. Uh, to win by seven laps shows that our strategy was right from the word go. And the cart still performing well. So many carts here had clutch problems and chains coming off. We just kept it clean and kept up a reasonably quick pace. Rallying now, and Ford's Colin McRae is looking for a repeat of last year's victory in Cyprus. Having won the first day, he and co-driver Nicky Grist started the second day in 15th place, on roads swept clean of gravel by the first 14 cars, as the leading 15 drivers pass through the stage in reverse order. In two left and two right plus. Second place Marcus Gronholm was forced to act as a road sweeper in his Peugeot 206, courtesy of his championship position. Double world champ Carlos Sainz was battling with his Ford. A broken drive shaft in the first stage was just the beginnings of his troubled event. Francois Duval of Belgium was an early stage winner for Ford and ended the first day in fourth place, just 17 seconds off the pace. Spaniard Science reunited with co-driver Luis Muea after he'd suffered two broken ribs during a testing crash in Catalonia last month, struggled in his Ford. They were plagued by power steering problems on the later runs as they finished well adrift of the leaders. A little bit tired, yeah. It's not the best, way, best stage to, to lose power steering in this stage series. Right. Alistair McRae also broke a drive shaft on his Mitsubishi as all the drivers battled the rough conditions. Colin McRae also lost most of his power steering on day two, but the Scott fought back after mechanics worked on his Ford Focus at the service park. Another former champ, Marcus Gronholm, was aiming to give Peugeot their fourth straight victory and hold second place, but he made the wrong tyre choice as rain brought muddy conditions. Four-time champ Tommy Mackinnon set the fastest time on the longest 30-kilometer stage, but a slow time in the rain left him third, 90 seconds down in his Subaru. Stalling didn't help, but this corner was to be fateful later on. Norwegian Petter Solberg made up almost a minute on the rest of the field in his Subaru as he took back-to-back -to -back stage wins. champion Richard Burns made up five positions to fourth as he put on an improved performance. Tommy Mitsubishi's Alistair McRae arrived at the hairpin left, but Burns. unlike Mackinnon, he didn't stall. Right. stay in? The battered car retired on stage 12 with a broken drive shaft. <laughs> Estonian Marco Martin moved to fifth overall. His teammate McRae overcame his early problems to extend right, his lead over Gronholm. No, it's not huge, and there's still two days to go, so uh, we just need to keep on pushing and hopefully we, you know, we can be quicker than Marcus. The Scotsman's lead went up to over 25 seconds as some sections were driven three times. He took advantage of muddy conditions to extend his overnight advantage over Gronholm.
But Marcus wasn't letting Colin get away as the rain changed conditions constantly. Tommy Mackinnon, benefiting from his tyre choice, moved to a podium position in third, but was more than 90 seconds adrift of McRae. Burns was unable to concentrate fully in the Cyprus heat without an interior fan in his Peugeot, but he went to fourth in his first gravel event for the team. Peugeot teammate Harry Rovenpere of Finland was running nine seconds behind him. Estonian Martin was a further nine seconds back, keeping up the pressure on the Peugeot trio. Rovan Pera was another Say roller, stop. but he kept going. Peter Solberg was running in eighth place with a trio of stage wins. Martin kept going hey, in the rain, struggling to clear up his fog left windscreen. Please, well, just stop, let me do it. Into two minus right, hey, slippy. Colin McRae, revelling in conditions much more to his liking, moved to within 82 kilometres of his first win of the season in the shortest event in World Rally history. Ron Holm started the last day with just the McRae forward in front of him. With the rain seemingly a thing of the past, it looked to be a sprint to the line. Disaster hit McRae as he was given a wrong time split by his own team and crashed trying to make up time. But Grantham wasn't making any mistakes and quickly made up time on the hapless Scott. McRae conceded the lead to Marcus as his power steering failed and he dropped 50 seconds. Roadside repairs weren't too successful, but things would get worse for both the Ford teams. Martin crashed too, tearing a front suspension arm loose, although he soldiered on. Burns had finally found his race pace to cut through to third place behind his teammate Andy Cray. Doing so, he displaced Mackinnon, who still hasn't come to grips with his Subaru after four titles with Mitsubishi. Rovan Pera was on a charge too, despite knocking off his rear bumper. Peter Solberg was one of many top drivers to damage their cars on the hard gravel surface as he rolled on the twisty downhill section. He eventually finished fifth. McRae took every opportunity to patch up his Ford as he limped towards the finish. Watch for flames in the cabin as Marco Martin rolls his Ford Focus, but he was able to restart and race on. The luckless McRae rolled again, this time doing more serious damage and losing another two minutes. And he had another problem too. Yeah, we're still in, but I think we dropped about two minutes. I'm not sure what position we are, but we've got no wipers, that's the problem, so I hope the rain stays off. Ronholm knew he was leading, but he couldn't let up, and as the rain came down, any hopes McRae had would have been washed away. Burns, now promoted to second, was nearly a minute off the pace, but just seconds ahead of Tommy Mackinnon. Skoda's Kenneth Eriksson was one of several drivers caught out by another sudden change in the weather. McRae recovered to claim sixth spot after winning a last stage battle for the final driver's point with German Armin Schwartz in a Hyundai.
second and just failed to catch Burns, taking third place just 2.2 seconds behind the world champion. Ron Holm and Timo Rautianen finished 56 seconds ahead of Burns and moved 11 points ahead after five events in the 14-round series. The result gave French team Peugeot their fourth consecutive 1-2 finish as they moved 41 points clear in the Manufacturers' Championship. Championship now moves to South America. NASCAR Bush Series support race at the Talladega Oval in Alabama saw only 13 cars make it to the finish. On lap 15, 27 cars were involved in this spectacular collision. Remarkably, there were no injuries beyond Mike Harmon needing stitches when he bit his tongue. It's the big one. Oh boy, who is that still? Sauter. It was Johnny Sauter. There's not anybody left. I mean, I only see about four or five cars that are coming around through three and four right now that were not in this race. They see Mike McLaughlin at 18. They're still getting upside down people, cars driving under cars. There has to be 25 cars over there. That's Michael Waltrip. Damage. Jason Keller avoided the pileup and gave himself a three-day early birthday present. He started 12th in his Ford Taurus and made it to the front after a few laps. Stacy Compton was the only other driver to pressure Keller over the final laps and finished second in a Chevrolet, while Tim Federer was third in a Pontiac Grand Prix, the only other driver on the lead lap. But you know the good thing about that? The whole time it's moving, it's dissipating in. The next day, the 499-mile Winston Cup race was held at the same track and incredibly saw a repeat of the previous day's huge crash. Wide open. They complained about their cars and uh, they raced pretty darn good. Uh -oh, Kyle caught up. As they did the previous day, the use of restrictor plates slowed cars and packed the field, leading to the huge pileup. The result was a 24-car accident with 25 laps left to run that was triggered when Mike Wallace, Kyle Petty and Stewart appeared to make contact. Again, and remarkably, no one was seriously hurt. He's okay. Matt Kenseth is out of the car and okay. Bobby Labonte has climbed out. 29 and the 31, both the children's cars. Spilt oil from Tony Stewart's Pontiac needed to be cleaned up, prompting a red flag caution with six laps to go that bunched up the field. On the final restart, Waltrip kept a group of drivers, including Kurt Busch, Jeff Gordon and Kenny Wallace at bay, allowing Dale Earnhardt to claim his sixth career win. Earnhardt took a celebratory victory spin on the infield grass. In nine races this season. It was the first win by a Chevrolet Monte Carlo this year, but Chevs have won the last six races at Talladega. His dad was the intimidator today. Junior was the dominator. Get that right. Matt Yoko. In a shower of mud. Dale Hart Jr. breaks a winless streak dating back to his win here last fall. The revamped MotoGP circus moved to the high-altitude Fakisa circuit in South Africa for the second round. A wet first round in Japan failed to show whether the two-stroke bikes would remain competitive. Japan's Toru Ukawa on a four-stroke 990cc Honda tailed teammate and world champ Valentino Rossi. Some riders went soil sampling, but the two four-stroke Hondas opened up a gap. Rossi led into the first corner and held it for 18 laps, but Ukawa slipped by with nine laps to go as Rossi looked over his shoulder. Carlos Checa tried to hold on to third, but was displaced by Loris Caparossi. With three laps left, Rossi reclaimed the lead. Team manager Jeremy Burgess was watching his riders dueling for the lead. Alex Barros was another crasher. After treatment to the track, the Brazilian was declared unhurt. Rossi retook the lead on lap 25, holding it to the final corner, but entered too fast and lost the back of the bike, forcing him offline and allowing Okawa to slip by on the inside. The rest of the field were way off the pace of the two four-stroke Hondas, which also set the pace in Japan. 
Capirossi was seven seconds behind and fourth place Daijiro Kato was 25 seconds adrift. Yeah, sure, I'm very, very happy, you know, so I'm fast in uh, 500, not 500, sorry, MotoGP. Also fighting for Valentino, then I win, so I'm very, very happy. No four strokes in the 250cc class, but Tony Elias and Jarno Janssen were judged to have jumped the start and given stop-go penalties. Australian teenager Casey Stoner took an early second place, but after three laps, the bumpy track and hard tyres caught him out. Marco Melandri took the lead on the first corner and pulled away. Two-thirds of the way through the 26-lap race, he had an eight-second gap. Franco Patani, who held pole position, was second, while Spain's Fonzi Nito completed an Aprilia sweep of the podium. The win was Melandri's second in the 250 class. His only other victory was in Germany last year. The 125cc race was marred at the first corner with a five-bike crash involving Yui Chui, the 2001 winner in South Africa, and Lucio Cecinella. San Marino's world champion, Manuel Poggiali, won his first race of the season on his Jalera. He lost the lead twice but regained it, holding off France's Arno Vincent on an Aprilia and Spain's Daniel Pedrosa on a Honda with just half a second covering the three across the line. It was Poggioli's fourth Grand Prix victory and his first in South Africa. For 30 years, Swede Sven Gustafsson has been driving throughout Europe, and he wondered why we waste so much effort shifting a foot between the throttle and brake pedals. Now Gustafsson has a solution. This is a combined accelerator brake pedal and you accelerate like this and you brake like this. The idea is simple. By pressing with your toe, the car will accelerate. By pressing the pedal with your heel, the car will brake. Well, I was actually driving a forklift when I was 20 years old and, and I had to move my foot from the accelerator to the brake very often. And, and this, this, I thought, was a problem. So I thought, why not combine those two pedals? Because uh, you will gain a lot of reaction time. And also, it's more convenient. I was, there's only positive things about this. This is the key part of the Nomex single pedal system in order to, to different the acceleration and the braking mode and we have also a, a, a knob to to uh, adjust the strength of, of the electromagnet so it's very simple the three pedal system was invented by henry ford to prevent drivers accelerating and braking at the same time but most people are used to the current system says this taxi driver no, I think it's better with two pedals. I think this is more safe. The system saves 0.2 seconds when moving from one pedal to another. Volvo and Saab have tested the system, but have no plans for it. Well, that's all for this week, but so you stay on track and informed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.